Um, good morning. Uh, how is everybody? In spite of um, the striking similarities, I am not the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. <laughs> if you are here for the arrival ceremony, you're in the wrong building, you should be next door. Um, having said that though, we are here um, for us uh, at least as important event. We want to be able to commemorate uh, National Women and Girls HIV Awareness Day, as well as look at the intersection of violence against women and gender-based disparities. I am James Albino. I'm with the Office of National AIDS Policy. Um, and we have an exciting agenda for us today. Uh, I want to thank uh, many of my colleagues who are here uh, that helped put this together, but I especially want to thank uh, Delara, our intern, who's running around trying to wave people through, and Mala Adiga, where's Mala? Who's over the here, she works with NSS and is a, a terrific star and has co collaborated with me on, on a number of efforts. Um, I want to go through the agenda very briefly um, and go over some of the items. But before that, I just want to talk about some of the logistics. Uh, this event is being live streamed, uh, so we are on the web as we speak. Uh, some, at the same time, some of our friends from uh, State Department, HHS, and here at the White House are tweeting, blogging, and all that uh, simultaneously, so that's happening at the same time. Uh, you, you should have gotten a copy of the agenda which I do not have, um, but what we, will, what we will have is a few presentations followed by a panel. We will break, break out into three breakout sessions. Uh, the, the majority of you will stay here in this room, and there's two other breakout sessions. Uh, you should have gotten a blue and a green card. Uh, the breakout sessions are in room 405 and 485. Some of those cards may have been printed in, let's say, 428 but it's 405 and 485. We will then come back after the breakout sessions here uh, for some uh, additional remarks and comment and presentation and a wrap up. Um, the bio logistics of, of this place is that the bathrooms are out on the first floor, they're closer to the elevators. Uh, the, both the men's and the ladies' rooms are, are next to each other, close to the fountain. If you look for the fountain, uh, you'll find the uh, bathrooms next to that. Um, there is a cafeteria, so if you need to have a cup of coffee or, or water, you can get uh, uh, refreshments there. Um, if you leave the building at any point, you will not be able to come back in. I won't be able to wave you back in. Okay? We have a full agenda, so let's jump in. Our first speakers are Ambassadors Verveer and Gooseby. Ambassador Verveer was appointed by the President as the Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. The President's decision to create a position of Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues is unprecedented and reflects the elevated importance that these issues, um, how, how the administration looks at these issues. In her capacity as Director of the Department of State's new Office on Global Women's Issues, Ambassador Revere coordinates foreign policy issues and activities related to the political, economic, and social advancement of women around the world. Full plate. Ambassador Eric Goosby serves as the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator, leading all U.S. government inter international HIV efforts. In his role as ambassador, he oversees the implementation of the U.S. President's PEPFAR plan, as well as government engagement with the global fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. He serves, on, he serves on the operations committee that leads the U.S. Global Health Initiative. Ambassadors, please. Thanks. 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 Appreciate it. Sure. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Really wonderful to see everyone today. Um, a lot of friends, uh, colleagues, and mentors, uh, supporters, saviors in the audience, so it's great to be here. I um, want to thank everybody for being here. This is a special day of celebration for us uh, in so many ways. I'd also like to thank uh, Tina Chechen and the Office of National AIDS Policy for working 
to bring all of us together today to discuss this critical issue on women and girls, both in the United States and around the world. PEPFAR's uh, pleased to be part of the working group to examine these issues. They've been critical to us, and our focus on this uh, has been really since day one, and we appreciate the White House and the uh, assembled agencies uh, focus on this, uh, on this matter. I'd like to acknowledge Nancy Mahan, the head of the MAC AIDS Fund, one of our partners in responding to sexual violence, and the new chair of the President's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. I'd also, uh, representatives from PEPFAR's implementing agencies, without which we would be uh, without hands and feet, CDC, USAID, DOD, and the Peace Corps, who contribute daily to PEPFAR's successes. Finally, I'd like to recognize my friend, Ambassador Revere, who has been such a great partner and a great leader and innovator in this area and from whom I have learned so much. Uh, she will be announcing another joint initiative today between our two offices, offering small grants to grassroots organizations that work on gender-based violence issues. Ambassador Revere has been really a leading uh, force behind Secretary Clinton's and this administration's vision to ensure that women are a cornerstone of this nation's foreign policy. HIV AIDS is not just a health issue, it has and always has been a woman's issue. In low and middle income countries worldwide, HIV is the leading cause of death and disease in women of reproductive age. In sub-Saharan Africa, greater than 64% of those living with HIV are women. In some of these countries, prevalence among women, especially in the ages of 15 to 24, is on average about three times higher than among men of the same age. Gender roles also have a negative impact on men and boys. Many are encouraged to engage in risky behavior and discouraged from accessing health care. I'm pleased to say that PEPFAR has been a global leader in integrating gender throughout HIV prevention, care, and treatment programming, really aggressively for the last three years. As such, we've been a major supporter of working to help identify female-controlled prevention methods. We've invested more than $90 million over the last two years in microbicide research. Since 2004, we have supplied over 55 million female condoms, making PEPFAR one of the largest procurers of female condoms worldwide. Today, I want to say a bit more about our commitment to see PEPFAR used as a platform and a key entry point for women and girls. Through the Global Health Initiative, PEPFAR is committed to do its part in the broader U.S. effort to meet the comprehensive HIV and reproductive health needs of women and girls, including those living with HIV. PEPFAR is committed to preventing and responding to gender-based violence, which is a topic we hope to focus on here today. Violence fosters the spread of HIV by limiting one's ability to negotiate safe sexual practices, disclose HIV status, and access services. Country studies indicate that the risk of HIV among women who have experienced violence may be up to three times higher than among those who have not. Worldwide, anywhere from 15 to 70 percent of women report experiencing violence from an intimate partner. There have also been recent national surveys on violence against children in Tanzania and Swazi, undertaken with the Together for Girls partnership. The data show that roughly 30 percent of women and girls in Swaziland and Tanzania report at least one experience of sexual violence prior to the age of 18. PEPFAR thus supports the mainstreaming of gender-based violence prevention and response into our HIV program footprint. Over the last two years, PEPFAR has invested over $155 million in this area. But it is about our ability to impact lives that we are focused. We're starting to see results on the ground. Since 2011, PEPFAR supported post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV infection for survivors of sexual violence to over 47,000 people. That's nearly a 34% increase in the last 12 months. To make a lasting impact in the health of women and girls around the world, we must also work in partnership with national governments, with other donors like the Global Fund, and with the private sector, as well as with our colleagues in the United Nations. These partnerships pay off in the long term 
leading to sustainability and galvanizing global commitment. For instance, because of the work PEPFAR and its UN colleagues, gender-based violence is now included in the UN AIDS progress reporting for the first time. Daniel Legario has been our voice in that dialogue and we're very proud of that effort. I'm pleased to be here today to celebrate all that we've accomplished and focus us on what remains undone. I hope that today's events help us to give us the strength we need to achieve President Obama's commitment to an AIDS-free generation for women and girls. So I look forward to the dialogue today and thank you for coming. Good morning, everybody. Thanks from me, too, for your getting up so early and demonstrating your ongoing commitment on these issues. It's a real pleasure for me and a, a deep personal pleasure to team up again with Dr. Gooseby. He has such a long record of public service in the struggle against HIV AIDS. He's demonstrated continuing strong leadership at PEPFAR. And he not only recognizes the link between women and girls, HIV AIDS, and gender-based violence, but he is working energetically to address it. And that's why we're back here together uh, this morning with all of you. Because as he said, gender-based violence increases women and girls' vulnerability uh, to HIV. And in fact, there are studies for some countries uh, that show that that is truly a very high risk. And it is also wonderful to see so many colleagues from across government, from PEPFAR, from CDC, uh, from USAID, uh, Lynn Rosenthal from the Office of the Vice President, from the other offices in the White House, HHS, state, uh, and et cetera. And I, I do want to also um, acknowledge the saviors, as Dr. Goosby called you, uh, all of you from the NGO community who work so tirelessly uh, to promote women's health and combat gender-based violence. Secretary Clinton, time and again, has made the case that improving the health of women and girls is a high-yield investment that improves health outcomes for their families their communities, and their nation, and also advances economic growth and prosperity. It is a win-win no matter how one measures it. And President Obama's Global Health Initiative is doing just that. It is a critical principle of GHI that it be focused on the needs of women and girls and gender equality in a very significant way. This means that support for efforts to provide equal access to essential health care services, engaging men and boys as critical supporters for gender equality, and of course, responding to and addressing gender-based violence. And you know as well as I what a difference so many of these programs make. I, I remember, as Dr. Goosby was mentioning, the Peace Corps. I was in Zambia some months ago, which has a very high rate of uh, HIV. And especially among young women, that age bracket of 15 to 24, where the prevalence uh, for the infection is four times greater than for men. And I witnessed two programs there that have stayed with me. One was uh, a program that involves men uh, in, in efforts to help them understand why violence should not be a way of life, violence against women, and how they were going to village to village to persuade uh, others like them. And then a phenomenal Peace Corps program uh, that was working with vulnerable adolescent girls to enhance their self-confidence and most importantly to give them the skills uh, to be able to fight off the kind, of, um, uh, the, the kind of assaults that are on them uh, literally every waking moment of their lives, which they will describe to you, and I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing, uh, they will describe to you in significant detail. 
Now, the United States has made addressing gender-based violence a priority for our foreign assistance. Uh, and yesterday, we have all the chiefs of mission uh, at the State Department. All of the ambassadors are there uh, from all of the posts around the world. And Secretary Clinton uh, launched the first ever policy directive by a Secretary of State on gender to instruct our embassies to implement specific steps uh, to promote gender equality. And this complements what AID did uh, just several days ago here in the White House in also releasing its guidance for our development programs. Now, taking on two great health threats to women and girls, HIV and gender-based violence, can seem like a daunting task. And it is, because you know it and you do it every day, working to address it. And you also know that none of us can do this by ourselves, neither government nor NGOs, none of us. We've got to work in a very collaborative way because of the sheer scope and complexity of these two issues, which truly encourage us to work together, government with civil society, with the private sector. Dr. Goosby mentioned Together for Girls, which I think and he knows is a unique partnership that brings national governments together with civil society, with the private sector, with the United Nations, uh, with our own government agencies and so many others to take practical steps to address sexual violence against children, especially girls. Currently, work is underway in Kenya, Swaziland, Haiti, Zimbabwe, uh, with future work planned in Cambodia, Malawi, and the Philippines. And we have a special partnership with MAC AIDS Fund, and it's good to see Nancy here, and I know you'll hear from her later in the program, uh, because what MAC, uh, MAC's AIDS Fund has done is expand the availability of comprehensive services for survivors of sexual violence in South Africa, and it's a unique role uh, that they are playing, and they are playing it not as government, but working in collaboration with government. So fostering these kinds of partnerships across uh, the United States government uh, and the private sector is what the Global Health Initiative also encourages. And one area that clearly needs investment, I don't think there'd be an argument from any of you in this room, is support for those small grassroots NGOs and civil society groups who are on the ground every day working to address the link between the health issues and HIV. So as Dr. Gooseby hinted, uh, this is why we are very pleased to come here this morning to announce a joint initiative between PEPFAR and the State Department's Office of Global Women's Issues to provide close to $5 million in small grants to civil society and grassroots organizations to address gender-based violence issues. Grants up to 100,000 will be awarded to organizations working in one of the more than 80 PEPFAR countries to leverage existing HIV AIDS platforms and to support programs that prevent and respond to gender-based violence with the link to HIV prevention, treatment, and care across all sectors of society. So in closing, let me just reiterate two points that I think we all want to leave with you. One is that although much has been done, there is much that remains ahead of us. If we are to achieve the president's commitment of an AIDS-free generation, particularly when it comes to focusing on women, girls, and gender inequalities, such as the gender-based violence. And secondly, building partnerships is essential to achieving impact. This means working across the global health programs, working through GHI, ensuring coordination of our domestic and international programs, sharing lessons learned and best practices, and working together in every way we can. So I know that together we can do great things, we can achieve even more in the months and years to come, and we thank you deeply for all that you do every single day.
Could we give Ambassadors Goosby and Revere another round of applause? I think, personally, coming from a community-based organization, myself, I was the director of a hospice in Puerto Rico, uh, we often survived on small grants that we got. And a small grant that I got meant that I could hire an additional nurse. I could hire a doctor for another half a week or so. So that's a tremendous effort, and I really applaud your, your efforts. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everybody. To help um, frame today's conversation, uh, I've asked Dr. Janet Saul to um, provide us some data. And um, it, it was a little challenging to get some of this data. And she did a terrific job of putting together a, a, a brief white paper with 27 references of, of this data that we went through here in the White House and, and were astounded by it. I really encourage her to move forward with that paper and hopefully publish it at some point. So I'd like to ask Dr. Janet Sowell to come and present her, her information. Janet is, a, is a, re, a research psychologist at the CDC. She's been there for 24 years. She currently serves as a special advisor to the director in the Division of uh, Violence Prevention. She's a principal advisor on all strategic directions and special initiatives. Janet has also provided leadership within uh, the Department on Rigorous Evaluation of Violence Prevention Strategies, as well as linking science and practice. Prior to her work in violence prevention, Janet spent 13 years as a scientist in the Division of HIV AIDS at the CDC as well. So she has a unique perspective of working both on the violence front and on the HIV front, Janet. This is you, right? set up differently than mine, so I have to find the little icon. Thank you so much, James, and welcome, everyone. Um, honored to be here this morning. Um, I, I was asked to frame the discussion today with some data, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, violence against women data domestically and globally, as well as a little bit about what we know about this intersection between violence against women and HIV, and then talk for a minute about data gaps and opportunities. I'm going to do all of that in 10 minutes, so hold on, because I'm going to talk fast. Um, this is um, data from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey that CDC conducted and released the first report on um, late last year. Um, this is a nationally representative survey, and when we ask we actually asked men and women about their victimization experiences. I'm just I'm going to report um, the data from from women's experiences today. When we asked women about the experiences that they had with different forms of violence throughout their lifetime, nearly one in five women had experienced rape at some point in their life. Nearly half of those women experienced other forms of sexual violence like sexual coercion. And about one in six women reported having been stalked in their lifetime. A quarter of the women had been a victim of severe physical violence, specifically by an intimate partner during their lifetime. When we asked women about their experiences with these same forms of violence during the previous year, over a million women reported having been raped in the past 12 months. More than 5 million women were a victim of stalking, and nearly 7 million women reported being a victim of rape, physical violence, or stalking, again, specifically in that case by an intimate partner. When you look at these data, there are some overarching conclusions that you can make from them. Um, one that's not up here because I'm not presenting both the, the men's experiences and the women's experience, but is a conclusion in the report, is that women are disproportionately affected by violence. Secondly, that violence starts early in life. That the vast majority of the victims of violence knew their perpetrators and that the majority of those victims suffered some type of impacts, whether they be specific impacts or generalized poor physical health or poor mental health. Let's turn for a minute to global data and what we know about that. Some of these um, data points you've already heard this morning. Um, but from the WHO multi-country study, depending on the country that you look at, up to 12% of women um, in those surveys reported experiencing sexual violence by someone who was not a partner, and 59% reported experiencing sexual violence by a partner. 
um, the Violence Against Children surveys that were already mentioned, um, a third of women in Swaziland and a quarter of the women in Tanzania reported that they had been physically forced to have sex before they reached the age of 18. And these are nationally representative samples as well. And then regarding intimate partner violence, um, there are a couple of different um, sets of studies that are, that are presented here. The, again, the WHO multi-country study and the DHS surveys from 2008. And what you see there is a range. And on the lower end in some countries, 15 to 16 percent of women reporting experience experiencing intimate partner violence all the way up to 70 to 75 percent in some countries. So overarching impressions from the global data. Um, you, you can't help but notice the variation in the rates and some of that is because different survey methodology, different types of sampling, different questions asked. But some of that isn't. Um, within, like within the DHS surveys or within the WHO multi-country study you still see these ranges. But even despite those ranges, you still come to the conclusion that violence against women is widespread and it's unacceptably high. And that it happens across the lifespan, but it begins, again, early in life. Um, some of the same conclusions that you come to from looking at the domestic data. So what about this intersection between violence against women and HIV? Well, there have been multiple different paths that have been described. Um, this is these are very simplified, how I have them up here. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the direct effect that people have talked about where, um, you know, obviously it's plausible if someone is sexually assaulted um, that tr HIV transmission could occur during that assault. Um, what's talked about a lot in the literature is more this indirect effect that you see in the middle. Um, and it's much more complicated than what's on the screen, but basically what you have is you have violence against women and you have HIV and you have a lot of things happening in the middle. And I'm going to talk more about that and what we know about it in a second. Another pathway that hasn't been talked about quite as much is the plausibility that there are common risk factors. So there are risk factors that are contributing both to violence and to HIV, and I think that that pathway deserves a little bit more discussion. What do the data tell us about, about the intersection between violence and HIV? Well, the very first thing that we know is that there is an association. Um, and there are multiple studies, you've heard about some of them already, but that women who have experienced violence are at a much greater risk of HIV and other STIs. So why does that happen? What's happening with that association? What are the links? And this is where we begin to talk about that indirect effect pathway that, that was in the previous slide. There are a couple of different literatures that can help us think about that and, and offer some information that's helpful. First of all, it's very well documented that violence is associated with a multitude of adverse consequences in people's lives. They can be biological, psychological, or social. It's also well documented that violence is associated with increased HIV risk behaviors, and you see many of them listed up there that are in the literature. And so what you begin to build as you bring these literatures and this science together is that when you talk about violence against women and experience with that and increased risk for HIV, these are the things that are happening in the middle that I talked about. Um, people having these adverse consequences that lead to increased HIV risk behaviors. There are many ways that this could happen. I'm going to present one specific example. There's evidence that if people experience child sexual abuse um, when they're children, that that actually has biological impacts on them. It can affect the actual architecture of their brain. It can also affect how they respond to stress throughout their life. And then there's literature that says that people who, um, people who have certain kinds of stress responses are more likely to engage in certain behaviors like drug use or like um, high-risk sexual behavior. And we know that those um, behaviors are related to HIV. So this is just one of the ways that you can take all of this literature and pull it together and think about a path that could be occurring that relates um, experiences with violence early in life to increased risk for HIV throughout, throughout life. Others have described other paths. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with Rachel Duke's article in 2010 in The Lancet that talks about violence against women and gender and relationship, power inequity, and HIV. And she brings in some of these other variables like psychological distress and, and HIV um, risk behaviors. 
So given what we know about the prevalence and incidence of violence and what we know about some of these um, different literatures in the past, what, what is outstanding? What do we need to know more about and what are some opportunities? Um, we really need to understand those paths in more detail. Um, and, and so why? You know, what's the reason for that? Isn't it enough to know that they're related and there are some factors in the middle? What well, really isn't? Because we have limited prevention and service dollars and limited people who, who, um, who, ha who work on these issues. Um, and, so, and so if you imagine that there are two paths, there are many more than two paths, but just to think about it, if there are two paths between violence against women and HIV, and one of those paths say path number one contributes much more to HIV risk than path number two, then we would want to put our prevention or service efforts into path one. The other thing that we know from behavioral science literature, from sociologic literature, is that some things are easier to change than others. And so let's say you might have a couple of paths where they actually contribute um, similarly to HIV risk, but that the factors, that sort of chain of events in pathway number one, um, based on what we know in science, we think that those factors would be easier to change than the factors or the chain of events in pathway number two. Then again, we would want to put more of our resources into pathway number one. So it's really important for our prevention and response efforts to understand these pathways. The other thing that I think we could spend some more time on, like I said, is to think about that concept of shared risk factors. The beauty of that is that if you have some factors that are significantly contributing to both HIV and to violence against women, if you can change those factors, you can actually have an impact on both outcomes. The other thing that I think um, is an opportunity is to broaden the discussion about the intersection a little bit. So to think about, in addition to, to the link between violence um, and and HIV to think about violence and sexual health as a whole, to, so to think about other STIs and reproductive outcomes. And certainly there's some literature about that and people are talking about that as well. Um, and the other piece of it, the other intersection is, is, a, is sort of a little bit different take on this, which is the, the intersection between women who are already living with HIV and the impact of violence on their lives and what that might mean for access to services or to even getting their initial diagnosis or to staying in service. Um, and then finally, I think we have a current opportunity um, to gather information that could, could propel us in our, in our prevention science efforts. And that is that um, all around the world there are trials going on that are looking at you know, different types of strategies to prevent violence against women. And then we have other trials over here that are looking at strategies to prevent HIV. Because there is such a link between these, it's possible that when we're working on preventing violence against women, we might be also preventing HIV risk behaviors and vice versa. So when we're doing those kinds of studies, we should actually try to look at both outcomes and look for what we call crossover effects because we won't know if we're affecting both of the outcomes unless we measure them. I'm not really going to go over this. This is just repeating a lot of what I said. But what I do want to say in summary is that a lot of this can start to sound really academic. You know, paths and mechanisms and factors. But this is far from an academic exercise. Um, really increasing our knowledge base in, in this way increases the relevance to, because of our science. Because what it does is it's respectful and responsive to the complexities of women's lives. And if we do that, we're much more likely to make a difference in both our prevention and our service efforts. These are some, um, this is more information on some of the data that I presented. If, um, I don't know whether you'll have access to the slides, but if you don't, feel free to see me afterwards and I can give you all of these links. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Janet. I will provide my email address later, um, and uh, if you email me, I can send you uh, her slides. Um, we'd now like to ask Dr. Gina Brown to come forward. Uh, I pulled in Gina into this presentation very late on Saturday, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and I was happy that she was able to join us. She's going to uh, update us on some of the work that NIH is doing. 
Um, you may have heard uh, some reports over the weekend on the ISIS study and some numbers around that, and Gina will be addressing some of that. Thank you. Thank you. So actually, I want to say thank you for actually allowing us the privilege of being able to talk about some of the work that's being done on the research front to give us a much better understanding of women and the epidemic of HIV. I'm going to talk specifically about just some of the work that NIH has been doing for a long time, continues to do, and end with a little bit about what still needs to be done. And I think as you, as you hear, there's some work that we're actually doing that is very much in, um, really works well with what Janet has talked about earlier this morning. And, and also with the theme behind today's meeting of really understanding the issues of gender-based violence and what that can mean for HIV AIDS research as one of the many issues regarding women's HIV risk, I think that's something that often is underappreciated and probably overlooked. So for years, the National Institutes of Health has brought in experts from the community, scientists, academics community-based organizations, women living with HIV, and then within NIH itself, the experts on HIV-AIDS related issues to put together the annual trans-NIH plan for HIV-related research. And since the beginning of the plan, there's been a chapter that's specifically devoted to women and girls, um, and along that way, there's also another chapter that's very specifically devoted to health disparities. Our understanding of these issues has changed over time, and we continue to try and work ahead of the curve in terms of being able to anticipate what the issues are for women's, for women's HIV research and other areas, but also to have a better understanding from what we've learned about what the next steps are to continue to drive and increase our understanding of the epidemic um, in all groups, and particularly also in women and girls. With Office of AIDS Research Coordination, that's the office that I come from, we have people who work within etiology and pathogenesis, behavioral and social sciences. I'm within women and girls, and I work with microbicides and some with PrEP. And we coordinate to ensure that what's considered to be the, the priorities based upon this group of experts in each of the different areas, that these priorities are used to drive the budget so that we have an understanding that the work that's actually being done is work that has been prioritized and, and ensure that there's appropriate funding as much as we can to ensure that these priorities are, are met over time. We work two years ahead of time, so right now we'll be working on the 2014 um, plan. The 2013 plan is about to be released. This is used to not only drive NIH-related science, but also it's used internationally for scientists to have an understanding of what are the important areas that need to be studied, and they can work, can structure their work around meeting some of these important areas. We've had a lot that we've learned over time, and lear we've learned from basic sciences from the differences between men and women as a result of this NIH-based research. There's a tremendous amount of work that's being done to understand the differences for cancers, metabolic issues, substance abuse issues that are specifically different from women as compared to men. And that's also helped us build interventions and work with other organizations to make sure that there are interventions that are being studied to try and reduce the rate of HIV AIDS in women. As James mentioned earlier, just this past week at the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, CROI, the Women's Interagency HIV Study, and ISIS released some information. There are a number of networks that are available that are specifically studying the issues of women, and I'll talk about ISIS in a little bit, but Women's Interagency HIV Study really released some really somewhat devastating and impactful information that women with, from, of African American descent in the United States have twice the rate of dying from AIDS compared to their white counterparts. Women of African American descent have twice the rate of dying from AIDS than their white counterparts in this country. Promise Impact are two studies that are being done through NIH that are designed to help us have a much better understanding of not just mother to child transmission, but what it means to be able to implement these mother to child transmission prevention programs internationally and do it successfully. We've also gained a tremendous amount of data about pregnancy, women's health during pregnancy, maternal health and women's health during breastfeeding, and how that can help us better understand the issues of HIV risk. Microbicide Trials Network is a biomedical prevention studies, largely done in women, now beginning to include men to looking at what you can provide for people during sexual intercourse that will prevent HIV spread. 
but it's also specifically including women being studied during pregnancy, during adolescence, and understanding during menopause. We have a sense of what the risks are across the life cycle, but we also have an understanding of what the tremendous differences may be of interventions, microbicides, some PrEP across the life cycle. And I think one of the things that really has come forth from the Microbicide Trials Network is some of the interventions that work for men may not necessarily work for women. And I'm specifically pointing to the issues of PrEP, where there's been much conflicting data about particular populations of women for whom PrEP seems to work, but that there are other populations for whom PrEP does not seem to be effective. And I think that's important because it tells us that we need to better understand both the epidemic and the risks here. The Vaccine Trials Network has increasingly begun to enroll women in its vaccine trials, and the HIV Prevention Trials work Network does a tremendous amount of behavioral and social sciences work for our understanding of women, in particular the ISIS study, which was landmark in its ability to look at the domestic epidemic for a change and understand what are the issues of risk in women who are HIV negative, and then to provide us with some really dramatic data about women who've become positive who are followed within this study, but also some dramatic data about how you can actually follow women, because I think one of the arguments throughout my career has been that women don't participate and don't stay in participation. You can't keep them involved in trials. And they had somewhat of a 95% maintenance rate of women within this period of time that they were being looked at in ISIS. The AIDS Clinical Trials Group, the Adolescent Trials Network, all deal with some of the issues of treatment. Trials Network also deals with some of the issues of prevention. And those have been increasingly en enrolling women in their, uh, as numbers. And then PrEP and treatment as prevention. There have been a number of trials across the country some from NIH, Centers for Disease Controls, trials funded privately and internationally, understanding that these are priorities that, are, that have been developed um, through the NIH network to better understand women's prevention. And those have included women and give us a, a real understanding that some things work, some things don't, and that we really do need to sort out why. And lastly, that the clinical trial participants have increased over time. And my, when I started my career at the very beginning of the epidemic, much of the treatment work we did, much of the prevention work we done, did was done in men. And now we're looking at clinical trial participation with women of 45 percent, almost 46 percent of the enrollees in clinical trials. So as I talked about for a second, ISIS, which had a you know, very dramatic release of information this, this past week at the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, let us know that the HIV zero incidence in some communities of African American women is very similar to women in some communities of Africa. The HIV zero incidence in some communities of women, of African American women, similar to those in Kenya, similar to those in Tanzania. And that's important because I think we often have sort of an us and them kind of approach to looking at this international epidemic. And it really lets us know that we need to better understand this epidemic for all women and, and, um, and, and understand what are those similarities and what are those differences as we begin to look at ways to um, develop interventions. Some of the other work that NIH is doing, there are RFAs, requests for application, for people to submit research that will give us a much better understanding of reproductive health and HIV and its intersection, and a much better understanding of the biologic and immunologic female genital tract that lets us have a real, a, a clearer sense of the mechanisms of why women seem to be at greater risk for HIV infection than, than, than men in this country. There's also a much bigger effort for integrated research, so it's not just biological, but some of the biological intervention work, some of the biological basic science work also brings in understanding of the behavioral and the social sciences research on risk and prevention, and particularly around the issues of adherence. A growing area is multipurpose prevention technology, and it's affording women the opportunity to not just prevent HIV, but also to prevent pregnancy and prevent sexually transmitted infections. So there are products being developed, there are technologies being developed that will hopefully in the future allow women to do this, and it's a growing area of research in trying to gain a better understanding of just of the biological interventions you can do here, but also the behavioral and social sciences. Next week, there'll be a sexual violence and HIV research planning workshop, and this is designed to really have a much better understanding of this sexual violence interaction with HIV risk. Um, and, and, and of particular interest is being able to model not just the activities of you know, women having maybe increased sexual risk behavior or the actual act of sexual assault and by someone who has HIV infection, but to really understand what this may mean both biologically and immunologically for women and risk across their period of time. So it may not be just the activity, but it may be what that activity infers. And the tremendous amount of basic sciences research that's looking at inflammation in the female genital tract and what that means for HIV risk um, 
and how we need to really understand that better, what it means for the etiology of women's HIV, I think is, will, will come out of this. With, and hopefully out of this we'll get a white paper that will really give a sense of how the modelers can build this into our tremendous HIV prevention sciences and our tremendous HIV basic sciences work. And last but not least, the Centers for AIDS Research, CIFARS, have a biannual research conference on HIV in women. And I think there are a number of important issues with this. One is it really gets us sort of up to date. What are the current issues of HIV research? But perhaps more importantly, it's bringing along the next generation so that we have a sense of younger people growing up who are very interested in these issues of basic, biologic, behavioral, and social sciences around women in HIV research so that when we're all done, there'll be people who have come along who will keep this going. If you need additional information, you can go to the OAR website, the general NIH website, AIDS Info, and the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which has been responsible for a really tremendous amount of our understanding of some of the biologic differences between men and women in this epidemic. Um, and you can take a look at some of their literature that's there, and it'll give you a, a much better sense of what we do know, and also a sense of what the gaps still, still remain. We've done a lot. We still have a lot to be done, both in the biological, behavioral, and social sciences realm for HIV research in women. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. You can see this was very important information. It was very important that we loop her into this conversation. And I'm very happy she responded this weekend and came out and visited us. So thank you very much, Gina. Um, we will now move to our panel. And now we'd like to uh, bring the panel up to the uh, stage. For that, I will leave you with my colleague here at the White House, Lynn Rosenthal. Um, Lynn is the White House Advisor on Violence Against Women. And from 2000 to 2006, Lynn served as the executive director of the National Network to End Domestic Violence. She, represents, she represented 54 states and territories. Lynn played a major role, major advocacy role, in the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act in 2000 and 2005. We are so lucky to have her here in the White House, and I'm so lucky to have her as a friend. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. I want to join James in welcoming all of you here to the White House and Ambassadors Revere and Goosby. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and on behalf of President Obama and Vice President Biden, I want to thank each and every one of you for the life-saving work that you do in communities every day all across this country. Uh, we, I want you all to know from us at the White House that we are doubly committed to this issue. Not only are we working on the HIV front, but we've been engaged in unprecedented coordination across the federal government to address violence against women. You've heard today about the data, what we know and what we don't know, and about the scope of the problem around the world. And on this panel, we hope to pull all of that together to talk about what's working, what the challenges have been, and what is the path forward. Uh, we're talking today about the big picture, but I really want to begin by uh, rooting us in the story of one woman who I worked with many years ago at a battered women's shelter in Florida. And by the t time she came to us, she was already very, very sick. She had uh, been coerced into multiple types of risky behavior by her abusive husband. <coughs> Her husband controlled every aspect of her daily life. And if you've never seen a relationship like this up close, it's hard to understand. But through threats, intimidation, power, and control, he dominated every part of her daily existence. Uh, she was coerced into trading sex for drugs for him, which I think was her primary uh, path, as Janet talked about. So by the time she came to us, she was very sick, and in large part because uh, most of her existence went into managing the violence, keeping herself and her children safe. So managing her disease and taking care of herself was not something she had time for. So she came to the battered women's shelter, and here's why she came to the battered women's shelter at the end of her life because she wanted to know what it was like to live just a short amount of time free of that abuse. She wanted to know what that would feel like. And as she was dying, she started journaling 
for us. And at, at the very end of her life, she shared her journal with us, and I wanted to tell you what she said. She said, I felt like I was a throwaway woman. She said, I felt that people looked at me and blamed me for what happened to me. She said, please tell women like me that their lives matter, that, that they're worth something. She said, please tell everyone that their lives matter. I couldn't possibly have known that I'd be here today, 15 years later, in the White House, from the White House saying women's lives matter. And I really want to thank James for that, because he really, he echoed her words. He said, women's lives matter. So our panel is going to take on that task today of, of carrying that message forward. So I'm going to introduce them to you, and then we're going to start the conversation. Uh, Nancy Mann is the executive director of the Mac AIDS Fund and the chairperson of the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Uh, Carla Coppell is the USAID Senior Coordinator for Gender Equity and Women's Empowerment. Naduko Colonzo is the Executive Director of Liverpool VCT Care and Treatment, an Indigenous Kenyan women's organization, and many of you know her. Uh, Gina Goodwin is the Agnes Moore Faculty in HIV AIDS Research at Emory University and a professor in the Department of Behavioral Health Sciences and Health Education. And uh, Gina Goodwin, or I've talked about Gina Goodwin, Nancy Lee is the only person I'm missing. Nancy Lee is an Assistant Secretary of Health, uh, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health at the Health Department of Health and Human Services, and she is the Director of the Office of Women's Health. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into our discussion, and I want to start with you, Carla Coppell. Help us understand what we're talking about. Can you define gender-based violence and tell us about the intersection and how it fits into USAID's portfolio of gender-based violence programming. Sure. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, I wanted to commend everyone for this conversation. I've been working in international affairs for a long, long time, and too rarely is the intersection between the domestic and the international discussed, and what the, what the scope is really from learning to learn from one another and to, um, to create added value. I, I think a lot of what I'm going to say was implicit in remarks that others made earlier, but uh, particularly with regard to what we're talking about on gender-based violence, um, the, the references particularly that Dr. Saul made uh, to the range of issues. But just to sort of remind us how broad the issues related to gender-based violence are, we're talking about female infanticide, harmful traditional practices like early enforced marriage, honor killings, female genital cutting, child sexual abuse and slavery, trafficking in persons, sexual coercion and abuse, neglect, violence against the L members of the LGBT community, domestic violence, and elder abuse. And we're talking about all of these across the age spectrum. Uh, and what that means is we're going to have to deal with them differently for different age groups uh, as, we, as we contemplate the different issues. And I should say, in talking about that definition also, some of these we say, oh, these are not really domestic issues. And yet they crop up time and again, and we see their relevance. I recall in the newspaper recently discussions about uh, victims of uh, female genital mutilation here in the United States among immigrant community. And so I think it's important for us to remember that while the, the predominance of some of these issues may be less within the US, they always are relevant. Um, and, uh, and in a country made up of different ethnic groups and immigrants that have come at different times, they may be more relevant than we believe. Now. Uh, where is USAID on all of this? Well, obviously, AID is the foreign aid agency of the U.S. government, and we're a key implementing agency uh, of PEPFAR, along work, working closely with the Global Coordinator's Office, uh, with the Global Women's Office at, under Ambassador Verveer, with CDC, uh, with Department of Defense, and, and other partners. Um, we implement and monitor a wide range of gender-based violence and HIV-AIDS programs. And consistent with PEPFAR guidance, what this means is we're integrating our gender-based violence messages into HIV prevention and community-based programs, uh, integrated screening referrals and the provision of post-rape care into HIV counseling and testing sites, prevention of mother-to-child transmission programs, and other HIV services. And this emphasis on integration is something that we're always striving to move forward and to emphasize. Um, one program we, uh, I want to mention just to sort of 
make this real in essence, because I'm sounding awfully clinical after Lynn's uh, <laughs> introduction, um, is the Go Girls program, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. It was implemented between uh, 2007 and 2011, uh, and it was a PEPFAR special initiative that was overseen, managed, and evaluated by AID and implemented actually by, by Johns Hopkins University. Uh, it recently, or very recently, was recognized as one of the Women Deliver 50 Most Inspiring Ideas for Combating Gender-Based Violence and was undertaken in Mozambique, Botswana, and Malawi. Um, it involved a multi-sectoral multi integrated uh, application of the socio-ecological model. And what we saw as a result of it was, was really exciting because it not only resulted in, in improvements in terms of health, um, but it increased HIV knowledge, it increased adult-child relationships, it increased uh, perceptions of school safety, um, legal literacy, and placed an emphasis on uh, monitoring and evaluating those results so that we can say all those things with a degree of confidence uh, and gets to some of the research gaps that Dr. Saul mentioned earlier in how we know uh, that we're making a difference. Uh, in this case, we, it combined two indices, a vulnerable girls index and a supportive community index uh, to look at whether we were getting traction. And the result was that we saw we were gaining traction over a relatively short period of time which means that these interventions can really make a difference quite quickly. I'll conclude by, by saying that we've gotten an enormous boost on these efforts as a result of a couple of frameworks that were very, very recently adopted. Um, Ambassador Vervier referred to our new gender equality policy, uh, gender equality and female empowerment policy. That was released on March 1st in this very room. Um, mm -hmm. We also uh, are very pleased that we now have a national action plan on women, peace, and security, um, which was released by Secretary Clinton and accompanied by a presidential executive order in mid-December. And we and the State Department and DOD are all actively working on developing implementation plans for that national action plan. And and explicit in all of these is an emphasis on gender-based violence and the integration of attention to gender-based violence in health programming. Uh, so what this means is uh, a growing focus um, to be complemented within USAID and the State Department by a gender-based violence strategy. And I'd be remiss in not mentioning that we have this afternoon a listening session on the creation of the gender-based violence strategy for AID and welcome mm -hmm. all of you to participate if you'd like to join us because it is an opportunity for sharing this kind of information. So with that, I will close, but I will say we are firmly committed to our interagency partnership firmly committed to taking these lessons from the international environment and seeing how they apply domestically, uh, and really uh, very excited about the ideas of integration and the connections and synergies among these different fields. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Carla. And we will come back to you in just a few minutes. Naduka, I wanted to go to you next. Tell us more about uh, your organization, the Liverpool VCT Care and Treatment, and the, the lessons learned that you would share with us today. Thank you very much. I think the first thing is to say I'm really honored to be here and to thank uh, Pepper and the White House uh, for, for the opportunity to make this presentation. Let me start by contextualizing Kenya. We are a country of about 40 million people with a HIV prevalence of about 7%. Uh, 52%, slightly over half are women, and more than 60% are youth. And the prevalence of gender-based violence um, in its various forms is almost 25%. Now, LVCT is an indigenous Kenyan organization that was started in 2001. And uh, as, uh, I'm, I'm really glad about the, uh, the grants the, and the program that has, has been started today because it really does benefit organizations such as LVCT. And uh, I think we have demonstrated that PEPFA support, and in this case that was through CDC um, primarily and, in, and with USAID support now to local organizations, can actually result in national level leadership organizations with accountability for results and resources. And um, LVCT has a staff of about 210 uh, currently, up from six, 10 years ago, and about 70% of our total funding over the last uh, 10 years of almost 40 million has been from PEPFA. So thank you very much. Now, our primary focus is on uh, uh, delivering quality assured testing and counseling in Kenya, and we aim to link those who are tested uh, to prevention and to treatment. But I also think one of the things about LVCT is our focus on people who are vulnerable and uh, vulnerable groups and populations. And this is how we started our work on sexual violence in 2004. Um, 
for instance, between 2010 and 2011, we tested over half a million people uh, of, and uh, provided ART to more than 8,000 women, men, and children. And I'm always proud to say, and especially uh, as I'm here in the White House, that in 2006, we provided counseling and testing um, to the US President, Barack Obama, and the First Lady when he visited. <laughs> I cannot help but say that one. So thank you very much. And, um, Coming to the work on uh, gender-based violence and what it is that I bring and I'm able to share today is to say that uh, we have undertaken research since 2004 to be able to provide models for delivery of uh, post-rape care services in resource-limited settings within public health facilities. I think most models are based on um, services that are standalone facilities that may not always be easy to scale up and feasible in resource-limited settings. So so we worked with the Ministry of Health and the Sexual Offences Act Implementation Task Force over the years to develop national standards for care, uh, not only for the health sector, but also for the legal sector. And by 2007, we did a costing study and we estimated that actually delivering services of, um, uh, to survivors of sexual violence would cost approximately $27 per survivor who did not require additional inpatient care. So basically that, sells that, that tells us that this is really a doable project. Um, I'll give just a small story. Mary Otieno um, is about 16 years of age and she's one of the survivors of sexual violence and she lives in Western Kenya, which is uh, in, in sort of a little far away from being able to access the district or the provincial hospitals. And last year, she was one of the 15,000 survivors of sexual violence that LVCT has provided services for over the last six years. And uh, following rape by her neighbor, she was able to get to the Rachuonyo sub-district hospital where we have uh, services that are decentralized, which is uh, currently four kilometers from her village. And she was able to get urgent medication uh, including prevention for HIV. She was able to get trauma counseling. And also our auntie who brought her to the facility was able to get, uh, was able to get trauma counseling and support because it's not just about the survivor, it's also about their family and it's about their carers. Her carefully documented examination notes, which has been one of the biggest challenges in a country such as Kenya by, the, by one of the over 600 uh, healthcare workers that have been trained by LVCT, made her presentation to the police station much easier. And what she had to say um, for our feedback um, when she was asked to provide feedback was she felt cared for. Mm. So I think that really just gives an example or an outline of what it is that we do. So what are the lessons that we have learned? I think I'll just speak to three primary lessons because I could like have a list mm. that could go on a long mm. time. And I think the first one is GBV and HIV are interlinked and we cannot respond to one without the other. Uh, for a long time we've been responding to GBV to HIV only, and increasingly we are responding to sexual violence specifically. But we also know that most women or people who experience sexual violence are more likely to experience other forms of violence, and I think the data this morning just showed that. And this also exacerbates the risk of HIV. And what we know is that we see many women in our HIV programs who require uh, services, not only sexual violence services, but broader gender-based violence services. I think simply put is to say gender-based violence and HIV are both global epidemics that are mutually reinforcing. And our ongoing investment must look at broader gender-based violence because that's the only way we are going to get the return on investment we want to see in HIV uh, prevention um, and treatment goals in the long term. I think the second key lesson is that we have very limited knowledge of what works and the evidence base for what it is that we need to be doing. That does not mean we stop and we wait until we have evidence. I think we have learned from HIV that a learning by doing approach is possible, it works, mm. and it is necessary. And so despite that, there are lessons from scaling up HIV services. Now, we have systems and we have infrastructure currently in place that can be applied. I think of importance is to note that the additional cost of layering gender-based violence services on HIV is most probably going to be minimal if you know the example of the costing that we have is, is anything to go by. And so we have to take on a learning by doing approach. And on July 30th and 31st this year, LVCT in collaboration with Kenyatta University will host a learning meeting to explore the GBV HIV questions and the linkages. 
and I can provide further details on that. Then the third thing is that targeting GBV in silos will eventually be counterproductive. And I think this is the lesson that we as LVCT have learned. Our investment must include the health, not only the health, but the law, order, justice sectors, mm -hmm. and social services. And it must also go beyond services to include prevention. I think early on, um, we started by investing only in the health sector, but we learned that if we are going to have positive outcomes for survivors, we must be able to invest in other sectors. And that's how we ended up beginning to look at the chain of evidence and beginning to look at locally assembled post-rape care kits uh, for the Kenyan situation. And the other thing is we must not posit prevention against, uh, against uh, treatment or against services. I think often we do that and what we really need and what we have learned is that it's not an either or. The only way to reap the long-term benefits and if the lessons from HIV is anything to go by is we must look at both prevention and response today and as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And you brought us right to Gina. Gina Wingood, your work has been in the area of developing evidence-based practices, specifically here with African-American women. So can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Certainly there are. First of all, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. There are evidence-based interventions for African-American women as well as other women at risk and living with HIV. CDC disseminates these programs. These programs talk about what places women at risk for HIV? Why are you a woman? What do you enjoy about being a woman? What do you, who are your role models? How can we increase your self-efficacy? How can we increase your self-confidence? But they also address gender-based violence. What is gender-based violence? What is sexual violence, emotional violence? What is the link between HIV and GBV? What are local resources in your community and how can you reach those resources? These interventions have been shown to reduce high rates of risk behaviors, increased condom use, increased negotiation, and reduce sexually transmitted infections. What we've learned is about tailoring as well. There are programs for women, there's programs for adolescents, as well as women living with HIV. These programs differ not only on their CRO status, but also on their developmentally importance. Adolescents, adolescent interventions are very different for interventions for women. We have to understand that prevention starts early. It's really crucial to focus with adolescent populations. We have interventions. If you look at a map, CDC does a great job of disseminating interventions across the United States. But what we've learned is we need to actually target. We've learned about the importance of hotspots or where HIV really is nationally. What we need to focus on is not simply dissemination, but saturation in these areas called hotspots. And also importantly, talk about social interventions, not simply behavioral interventions that we can work on. Legal policies, as was mentioned earlier. It's really talking about saturation, social interventions, and sustaining evidence-based approaches. I think that's what we're gonna learn today. Thank you very much. Gina, thank you so much. And Nancy Lee, I want to turn to you because the Office of Women's Health is all about collaboration across sectors. How do you do it? What are the challenges you faced in integrating GBV work with HIV AIDS? Um, challenge, yes. <laughs> um, I think it's fair to say, I just want to put this out on the table, that um, our international community, the global health community, looking around uh, prevention of HIV and gender-based violence, is way ahead of what we're doing in the United States. Mm -hmm. So let's just put that on the table. And it's, I think there are many reasons for that. Um, what my colleague and mentor, Francis Ash Gowen, says, it's because, you know, when you're in small countries, they have to, everybody has to do everything. And so you can't have silos so much. And so here we have lots of silos. So um, I think um, some years ago, the work that we were doing in the Office on Women's Health, which if you don't know, is not very big. We've got 40 people in our office here and in the, in the regions. Um, realized that we really needed to coordinate and collaborate and bring people together um, to, to sort of address this issue. So we have been working with uh, CDC with HRSA, um, with NIH, and with other federal agencies in HHS. We've been working with Department of Justice. And um, 
we, we do this in a variety of ways. We are, as I said, not very many people, and we convene, we participate in their work, they participate in ours, um, and we continue to make the case that it's important to, uh, to see the intersection and deal with the intersection of gender-based violence and HIV. We um, have, uh, we last, in 2011, last summer, we had the first um, conference on gender-based violence and HIV. Um, it was sort of at the, at the beginning of the big CDC conference. And we intend to have that conference again. Um, we are, <clears throat> in all of our grantees, we have grantees to HIV um, organ uh, organizations which provide aid services to women. We also have grantees who do domestic violence prevention services. We are now cross-training all of those organizations um, to, um, to consider the, the intersection between gender-based violence and HIV. We are providing the same kind of cross-training services to other federal partners. Um, and we continue to um, look for other opportunities. I think this is a wonderful uh, opportunity here, and I really appreciate uh, Lynn and James putting this together and inviting um, our, uh, me to give the perspective from the Office on Women's Health. Thank you, Nancy, and, and our other Nancy. Uh, you know, MacAIDS works both globally and domestically, so you really uh, have a great view and can really help pull all of this together for us. So tell us about that. Give us the view from your perspective. Sure. Well, um, private-public partnerships, as, as the other Nancy mentioned, I think, as, as in life, uh, are difficult and hard, but are definitely worth it. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to be partnering with Ambassador Revere and her staff and PEPFAR and USAID. Um, just briefly, the Mac AIDS Fund is a philanthropic arm of a cosmetic company, which most people in this room probably know. When I speak in front of men, they often think I make computers. They can't figure out how we raised $38 <laughs> million. Um, <laughs> computers and lipstick? You raised $38 million selling lipstick last year? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did raise $38 million selling lipstick last year with the help of Lady Gaga and happily with the help of Nicki Minaj and Ricky Martin. We are at selling Lady Gaga. Um, but I think it's, it's a, the, the, the giving that we do is basically in two buckets. One is around poverty and AIDS, primarily food and housing, and the other is around prevention. In terms of this area, we have been lucky enough to be partnering with Ambassador Revere and her staff, and as I mentioned, um, PEPFAR and USAID, on the expansion of the two Tuzela Care Centers in South Africa. Our international funding is primarily focused in South Africa and the Caribbean. The, the partnership, I think, has been a great, is a great example of how those partnerships work. Um, the bottom line is there's no way we could do this without U.S. government intervention and without the South African Justice Ministry, because at the end of the day, women and men want to go to a place where they're going to get help and where someone is going to be prosecuted. What the challenge is moving forward, I think, in terms of private dollars in this area, is that overall, A, private giving to AIDS decreased 30 percent last year. Um, the private giving that we do have, honestly, we're in this sort of funky position as Mac AIDS Fund. We're actually the, the second largest donor. Actually, Ford is still edging us out, and I see Terry McGovern. We're happy to be third, um, <laughs> but it looks like we're going to be second this year b behind Gates. But basically, Gates is at $435 million, and then it's us at $38 million. Um, and then uh, Terry is, I don't know, you may have, we're always trying to raise more money from Terry where she's coming in uh, beneath that. But it's basically very dominated by Gates, which is primarily biopharmaceutical and treatment. What we see across the sector is honestly that we are, ser we are private donor service poor. We have very few dollars for services. And where private dollars, I think, come in is we honestly can be uh, more, we're less risk averse. Uh, we don't have congressional appropriations. Um, and we can guarantee money uh, across sectors. Where, where we do need government is to partner with the South African Justice Ministry to bring in the knowledge. Um, I do think this area of global domestic um, knowledge transfer is very ripe for private public uh, partnerships. But overall, and this is my call to action, um, I was fortunate enough many years ago to work at the Soros Foundations, and I know from working with Terry and other bigger foundations, there is no way that the big foundations, the big private foundations, are going to solve this epidemic in terms of private dollars. We need more corporations involved, and I know both ambassadors has been very involved in that. But as consumers, I mean, the numbers on black women in this country are appalling. The numbers on MSM in this country are appalling. You need to write letters 
those letters come to me, they make a difference. You need to thank the corporations that do give money, um, and you need to encourage other corporations that sell products to those populations to give money. What we see in corporate giving is primarily the pharmaceutical companies, us, and companies that basically have worker populations that have been impacted, and that's primarily been in Africa. So we do not see a lot of corporate giving here in the US, mm -hmm. um, which is a shame and we need to encourage more of it. Um, and then lastly, just following up on, on uh, Ambassador uh, Goosby's uh, good reminder of the, of the President's bold and important goal of an AIDS-free generation, I would love to use the International AIDS Conference as an opportunity to map out what that would look like. And in the area of gender-based violence, the issues that we see is one is that violence is generally not understood, and we see, for instance, lots of gender-based violence um, in countries that we fund uh, primarily Jamaica, um, the Dominican Republic in South Africa, where there's a long history of civil violence. And so I think we need to bring in the folks who do violence-based work and understand where gender-based violence fits in in the spectrum of violence. Um, AIDS and AIDS prevention, you know, some of the great science that was present, presented, again, it's emerging. I think we need more of it. Um, and lastly, we don't have a lot of model programs to scale. I mean, we basically have two to sell a care center, um, and there might be one or two other programs, but we basically need more great programs mm -hmm. as a program in Kenya, and then we need to work to basically ensure that we have the private and public donor dollars to scale those programs. It's always terrific to end with an inspiring call to action, so I think we will leave it there. I mean, some of the things that stood out were the importance of pulling in other sectors, you mentioned the justice and health sector working together. We heard about what works, what we know works, and how we need to do more of that, but also what more we have to learn. Uh, and we heard about where we are internationally and where we need to go domestically. So now it's your turn. Give our panelists a big round of applause. And I, I might need James to help me with the, your instructions on the next steps, but we, you've been very patient in sitting and listening, and each and every one of you are experts who could be up here in your own right. So we're going to give you a chance to do that now. So um, I think you're assigned groups. Yes. Uh, you have a card. Some of you, which card are staying here? I'm going to explain that in a second. Oh, okay. I'm going to turn it over to James then. Some of you are staying. Some of you are going upstairs. All of you are going to be contributing in a very important way, so thank you very much.